In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Okay. <clears throat> this is episode 11 of Out of the Boat, and today we are joined with Garrett, Jonathan, and Brother Morgan. And today we're going to talk about uh, fulfilling the next step in your life when you're walking in the call of God and identity in Christ. So you can take it away. You want me to go ahead and start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, you know, when you talk about fulfilling God's plan for your life, then I would say that the first thing you got to do is, is know what God's plan is. And I would encourage people. You know, Paul, writing to the church at Rome, makes this statement, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then it says, don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed. And this is the key statement, by the renewing of your minds, that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The next verse is very intriguing to me, and I think many times it's misquoted or taken out of context, because then he says, a man should not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, for God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And he didn't say a measure of faith, but the measure of faith. So it all hinges there on the fact, number one, of presenting myself as a living sacrifice. And I think that's where I'm dying out to myself, dying out to what I want to do. I'm dying out to my will, which is the hardest thing anybody will do. You know, it's, it's in us to be self-willed. That's just human nature. And uh, so I think the toughest prayer that Jesus ever prayed was in the garden mm -hmm. when he said, not my will, but your will be done. And so... I think for all of us that applies, it's the same thing to us. Do I live my life according to what I want to do, according to my will, or do I live my life according to the will of God? That's the key. So then the only way that I think that a person can find the will of God is by going to the altar. I think that's exactly what verse 1 means. You know, if you look in the scripture, you'll find that there's a throne of God, and in a lot of the verses, in close proximity to the throne, is an altar. And uh, the Bible says a man's gift will make room for him, bring him before great men. You know, I know how we've used that verse, but the reality of the verse is, is that the only way I can get into the presence of a great person or a great man is by bringing him a gift. And so I think in order for us to get to the throne of God, and where the word of a king is, there's power. And then the wise man went on to say, and who can question it? In other words, who in the world would ask a king, what are you doing this for? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that when we approach it from that, understanding that, you know what, I've got to, I, I've got to go to the altar and I've got to die out. My will has got to die out. Now, once that happens, now I can get to the throne of God where God can speak to me give me clear direction. It's amazing that in the Lord's Prayer, he associates thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. didn't say on earth, but it says in earth. I believe that's us, as it is in heaven. So I think the altar alters our life to where we get an alignment with the will of God. Yeah. And uh, I don't think there's any other way to it. And I, I would say here, uh, just a little precautionary thing is, you can't determine the will of God by what somebody else tells you. Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got to get it for yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know people, I call them prophetic junkies. <laughs> I mean, they, they go to every conference, they're at every deal. You know, God, I need a word, I need God to talk to me. You know, I have people come up all the time, you know, uh, why is God not talking to me? What, you know, and I tell them, I say, well, there's two things that I'd have you examine. Number one is, you're doing the will of God. He doesn't want to distract you yeah. with what's in your future. So he stays silent. Just keep doing it, and when it's the right time, I'll speak to you. Or the second thing is, you're not doing what I've already told you. So why would I keep 
compounding it and stockpiling it on you because you're going to have to answer for it. So, you know, uh, I've been around enough to know that, you know, we can be at certain places and somebody prophesy over us or they got a word for us and this is the will of God for your life. But, you know, an old wise preacher told me one time when I was dealing with a situation where somebody had called and was a prophet and called and said, you know, you, you, you got 30 days to leave Oak Mulgee. That's where I was passing at the time. God's going to write Ichabod above the door of that church. Well, man, it, you know, in one sense, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm free now, you know. <laughs> the other one was I was really confused. Uh, you know, it just, it, it just didn't settle right. And so my wife come by, picked me up for lunch, and uh, I told her, and she said, you know, that don't make sense to me. You need to call an elder. So I did. I called an elder. And this is what he said. He said, Mark, are you backslid? <laughs> and, you know, jokingly, I said, well, not today. I, I, I'm, I'm okay today. He said, why does God have to put your mail mm. in somebody else's mailbox? Mm-hmm. I mean, don't you have enough relationship with him that he can yeah. speak to you that's and good. share with you these things? Now, I think that's important. Uh, because when you really get down to it and you're trying to fulfill God's purpose in your life, you're going to meet a lot of obstacles, resistance, uh, things that are anti whatever it is you're attempting to do. And, you know, and if it's just somebody else told you that, that can wear kind of thin. Yeah. And the enemy can really work on you with, well, you know, what if they missed it and what if this and this and this. But, boy, when you know in your heart that God spoke this to me, then that goes a long ways with tenacity, the ability to stick with it and stay in there. And you need that. You need that, you know. Uh, We used to have an old saying, some called, some sent, some just picked up their Bibles and went, you know. (laughs) And you have to know. And here's the key. Let me get back on track here. Uh. He talks about the verse one, but then he says, don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your minds. The word renewing there means better. God wants to take your old mind, your old way, and give you something better, which is his will. Now, once that happens, then he says, go prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's what we're really after, is to do the will of God. Prove means... You've heard what he says. He's told you what to do. He's totally rearranged your thinking, which is the battle. Yeah. (laughs) And now you know, you you know this is the call of God. This is what God's asking me to do. And uh, I gotta go do it. You know, I've got to take those steps. And you know, it's it's kinda like Peter getting out of the boat. Sometimes you just gotta take that step of faith and say, Okay, here we go. You know, sink or swim. Here we go. Now, the next verse, again, is important because it says, A man should not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, for God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, four or five verses later, he said, If you're going to prophesy, prophesy according to the proportion of faith, which I don't think that means I can just flippantly say something and then God has to back it up because we start this whole thing by going to the altar and finding out what God said. Okay, now once God says it, once God speaks it, then you know you can take that to the bank. If you just thought it up or somebody else told you, then you know you're kind of on something that's pretty unstable. So the deal is, is a man should not think more highly. Uh, the measure of faith is not that we all got this measure of faith when we got the Holy Ghost or salvation. What that means is is God has set the boundaries and the perimeters in our life by telling us what his will is for our lives. Those are the boundaries. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So when God speaks to me and gives me that renewed mind, then that's, that's the faith. I believe that's what it is. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Now go do it. Okay, but don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Don't think beyond what I've told you. That's what gets a lot of us in trouble. You know, prophecy, the Bible says, is in part. And I found it to be true that prophecy is, a lot of times, he just gives you a piece of something. 
And then we try to make it the sum total or we get off track because it's just a piece of something. But we think it's the whole thing. And so I've learned in life to kind of, okay, God spoke this and shared with this to me. But now I've got to wait because there's more pieces. I've got to be relaxed. I need to be diligent, but I don't need to be frustrated because, well, it's not happened the way that I thought. That's where a lot of us gets in trouble. That's where I've gotten in trouble a lot of times because I think more highly. In other words, don't let pride cause you to try to assume the position of God where you know what the next step is. You know, I, I, I use this illustration a lot. It seems like it seems almost like a million times, but that might be a little <laughs> exaggerated. Is uh, if I have a man come up and I say, I want you, I'm God and I want you to go four steps and stop. And he does, then okay, and then another man stand over here, sorry, another man stand over here, I say, go seven steps and stop. You know, one of the worst things that any of us can do is compare ourselves among ourselves because every one of us has a different measure of faith. God's called me. Matter of fact, Paul, when he's addressing uh, fivefold ministry and all that, he says, according to the grace. Grace means it's, it's charis or charisma. Well, we get the word charismatic, it means a gift. So to each of us, God gives us the measure of grace that we need to fulfill whatever ministry or purpose or his will is in our life. I can't operate on somebody else's and vice versa. They have to operate according to what God spoke to them because when God spoke it, he gave me the gifts, he gave me the ability, the dynamics of it to fulfill it and to function in it. But when I get to looking around, let's say I'm the four-step guy and I get to look at this guy where well, there's at least three more steps, you know, then, you know, I don't know if y'all are married. No. Oh, boy. Sadly. Am I going to have, have to help you find somebody or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, you know, here's the deal. So, you know, my wife's over here saying, well, what's wrong? You know, don't you want to be successful? And that's another thing I think that we have to learn is we're not careful. We think success, especially in North American culture, is about numbers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know. But with God, that's not the case. Yeah. With God, obedience is success. I've used this illustration a lot. So if God speaks to a man and says, you go build a 10,000-member church, and he does. He tells another man, you go stick your nose in the corner and don't move till I come, and he does it, who's successful and who's not? We'd say the guy that built the big church is successful. But in the eyes of God, they're both successful. Mm -hmm. They right. both did exactly what God called them to do. That's why I don't think that you can try to be somebody else or try to do what they're doing because they're doing what God told them to do. Yep. And you can't emulate it. I mean, you can get certain DNA and be around stuff and, you know, catch stuff would be the best way I could explain it. So, But I can't compare myself with somebody else because when I do, Pride will take over, and I'll say, well, you know, there's three more steps. But honestly, I think that the moment I take the fourth step, I've now assumed the position of God. Mm -hmm. And that comes out of pride because I think I know what God wants to do next. I call that getting out of the boundaries. So God sets the perimeter, sets the boundaries of my life and ministry. Now, <clears throat> I've found this to be true among the apostolics especially that it's not so much pride that bothers us, it's fear. Mm -hmm. Because let me give you this example. Let's say here's the box. These are the perimeters. You go beyond it. You're full of pride. But what happens to the guy that is struck with fear and is crippled in the center of the box and never explores everything that God has for him. Because he's afraid he's going to make a mistake, or he's, he's afraid he's going to get out of the boundaries, or, you know. God can give you a pretty good job description, you know. But a lot of us, you know, we're just fearful, you know. Well, I don't, you know, that's a step of faith. i got to get out of the boat. I mean, man, if you're ever going to do anything for God, there comes a moment that when God speaks to you, it, it can be overwhelming, and 
kind of, uh, you know, man, how am I going to do this? Well, grace, <laughs> according to the measure of grace that's been given. So, but again, I think fear really cripples us a lot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what if this is not God? And, you know, uh, you know, I always said this, and I want to be careful how I say it, but what you got to lose? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I remember J.T. Pugh saying one time, he said, I'd rather be standing, I'd rather be on the banks of the Jordan River and people point to <laughs> bubbles over there and say, that's where J.T. Pugh went under, but at least he was trying to cross. Yeah. You know, and as long as we're paralyzed <laughs> with fear, we're never going to fulfill God's purpose. You know, I mean, there's always a little risk involved, but you got to trust God. And, uh, you know, if God gives you the vision, as Brother Jerry Dillon says, if he gives you the vision, he'll give you the provision. And so, you know, I, I think that's key to God's purpose in my life. And Romans, of course, all things work together for the good of those who are called. But if you'll watch this according to his purpose, we get so focused on our purpose that we overlook his purpose. Mm. But here's what I say. If my purpose is not helping his purpose, then I need to change my purpose. Yeah. You know, and his purpose is very clear. Next verse, uh, that we're conformed to the image of his son. So it's about spiritual transformation, being conformed. That's what his purpose is, is to transform us. And so anything that I do should be helping me fulfill that and should be helping everybody that I'm ministering to fulfill that. And, uh, you know, that's, to me, that's very vital that I understand that. And, uh, you know, I get frustrated sometimes. I just have to back up, okay, with what I'm trying to do, is it helping fulfill his purpose or am I kind of sidetracked over here with what I want to do? Yeah. Now I have to go back to the altar. Yeah. Sure. So anyway, that's probably the long way around to answer a simple <laughs> question. But anyway, I don't know if I covered it enough. or I kind of want to backpedal a little. Okay. You kept emphasizing the altar. I was wondering if you kind of describe what the altar really is because I feel like nowadays we kind of think after the sermon, go to the altar, shed a few tears and leave. But what's like the biblical definition of the altar? Well, that's to me it's pretty simple, but yet not. <laughs> the altar is where you die. It's not a place of prayer. You know, we say, come to the altar and pray. Well, you can get down there and pray, but not be dead. Yeah. yeah. So you're praying amiss. That's what the Bible says, you're praying amiss. So the altar to me, now I, I, there's words, I, I, I need to really be able to define this. But an altar is something that's elevated, okay? If we're not, all, if we're not careful, we can turn an altar into a platform. Mm-hmm. And we have to be very careful there. But to me, an altar is a, how, how can I say this? A raised cognitive thinking that at least I'm aware of something different. I don't know if I'm making sense. In other words, in my thinking, I've created a platform here that, hey, there could be something else. Mm-hmm. There, God may want something else. To me, I think that's, really what the altar is about. I think it's about a place that I go and I die. You know, not partially die, but I die. And a part of that is, is me putting my will on that altar, my ways on that altar to let it alter my life to where at least I'm opening my mind up enough. Because, you know, here's the thing, man, a lot of people think they're right. I mean, you know, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. Well, you know, I, I had a guy preach for me one time, and he, he preached a message on the only way to be right is admit you could be wrong. And the way that you're wrong is when you say you're always right. And so I think that in our minds, at least there's an awareness yeah. that I'm at least entertaining that there's something else here. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And I, to me, I think that's what the altar is. I'm just putting it there. It's got to die, and then I want the fire of God to consume it. And then what's left, I think, on the altar for me to take is the will of God or what God's really wanting me to do. And, uh, you know, that's how I've had to do it, you know, just because, you know, again, the will of God, man, it's just, 
it just violates everything you think, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of like a violent something that, you know, boom. And uh, now I have to comply to it. And if I'm not dead, I'm not going to. Even though he spoke it to me, I'm not going to. A living sacrifice. I asked Dr. Hughes one time, James Hughes, I said, what's that, what's that deal about a living sacrifice? He said, well, in the Old Testament, if you put a sacrifice on the altar, it, it stayed there. But with you and I, we can be on the altar today, but tomorrow we can crawl off of it. Uh. And so he said it's a perpetual, everyday thing that you live to please God. That's good. That you live wanting to do what's right. And he called it your reasonable service. It's really true worship. That verse deals with true worship. If I present myself a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, that's true worship. That's real worship unto God. So, you know, I want my life to be that. Not just what I'm saying, but I want my life and what I'm doing to to honor him, to honor him. And, you know, I... I I'm living it, hopefully, to the point that I can hear him say, well done. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if I answered your... No, it was good, yeah. yeah all right. <laughs> well, all right. What is your reasonable service? What would be our reasonable service? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, man, I've studied that out, and, and if I had the notes, I could really tell you. Uh, Fast one time a day. <laughs> <laughs> here, here, here's what I would say, Okay. Presenting your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So me offering myself as a living sacrifice, living a godly, holy life, uh, it's not unreasonable. Yeah. yeah. And that's what a lot of people think. Oh, you know, this. I, I, I seen a little clip uh, maybe yesterday of this guy. Man, it stuck with me. Matter of fact, coming over tonight, it just really resonated in my spirit you know god doesn't say he's joy 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 or he's love 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 but it does say he's holy holy mm. holy emphasizing that's the true nature of god we know he's love we know he's light but he's also holy and so when i'm living that kind of a life it's not unreasonable to god it's not now to the world and people around you there's like have you lost your mind yeah but, you know, we serve a holy God. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think when we allow that to operate in our lives and to conduct its ways through us, then I think that is a reasonable service. I don't think it's something that's crazy or unreasonable. I think it's a reasonable deal. For me to live the way that God wants me to live, in his eyes, it's not unreasonable. It's the best way to live, pleasing him. So that may not be a good answer, but that's no, the only, that, that was a great the only answer. one I got. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my second question was, how do you know, I know you're talking about um, whether it being like God's thoughts or your thoughts, because there's been times where like I feel like God's speaking to me. I was like, this is like my will for your life. And I was like, was that God or was that me? How do you decipher whether that's your flesh or that's God speaking to you? Well, I get asked that question a lot. <laughs> this is a simple answer. When God's, when the enemy's speaking to you or your own mind, it usually ends with a question mark. It's questioning. Well, you know, when God speaks to you, it's an exclamation point. It's just boom, there it is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you know. I, that's the only way I know how to say it. You know, you know. Let me, let me. Maybe this will help you a little bit. Most of our lives. Let me get. Make sure I get this right. Most of our lives, we live our lives trying to have faith that He will hear our voice. We'll learn His name, and He'll hear our voice. But it's backwards. He said, "My sheep know my voice, and I know their name." So you know. I, I don't have to muster up all this faith. You know, I gotta, you know, I I, I gotta get to God, and I'm, I I just know this: when God needs to speak, He can speak, 
and it resonates in your spirit. I feel a witness of it when it's God. I feel a witness in my spirit. Now, when something's coming to me and I get a little uneasy or I don't feel that witness, then I kind of back away from it a little bit. I always want to feel the witness. And another thing that I try to live by is when God speaks, now sometimes it can be a little uh, alarming because you're like, oh, wow, you know, that, really? But it also brings peace. And, you know, you have to guard that. You have to, you know, I, I can't remember the verse, so there it talks about like peace is like an umpire, you know. You got to guard it. You got to protect it because to me it's one of the guiding principles. So when I feel that witness of the spirit and I feel that peace in my spirit, now that doesn't mean, you know, if you have peace, that doesn't mean there's no resistance. It's not tranquility. It just means you have a resolve in your spirit that it's okay, you know. To me, that's what peace is. And then when God speaks to me, uh, you know, the other day, I, I know it was God. He spoke to me about a, a minister and what he would do. And, and it, you know, it's just and when God spoke to me, I mean, okay, yeah. Then I'm like, oh, wow. Because, you know, it involved, it, it involved some of my life and also his. So uh, I was like, and I'm now trying to figure it out. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, so we were at a conference this past weekend in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And he was there, so I, I told him, I said, come on, he's, I mean, right in the preaching, I said, just sit here next to me. So he did, and then I leaned over and I told him, I said, this is what I feel the Lord gave me the other day, involving you. And he's like, oh, wow, you know, and okay, you know. And I said, you feel that? He said, I don't understand it. What does that mean? I said, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not going to try to figure it out. You know, uh, you know, if I try to figure it out, then it's, it's, there's a lot that has to go through the filter Yeah, and then it's <clears throat> twisted up a little bit. So you just got to have peace. Okay. God, you spoke this and you'll bring it to pass. And I'm, I'm going to walk in peace with this. And when it's the right time, it, it, it'll be fulfilled. He'll do it. So, so long answer to a simple question. When he speaks to me, it resonates, and it's just like, I know, you know, Excl exclamation point, I know. <laughs> and when it's my flesh or the enemy, I have questions. And, like, mm, uh, yeah. Is that the Lord? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it's that way, I kind of just, I don't just totally dismiss it. But I just kind of put in a little portfolio back here and say, well, you know. Kind of like when I'm at the cash register and it's like <laughs> witness to that person. That's probably not God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the devil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes the, the devil speaks through people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, oh, I had another good question. Um, you were talking about uh, why does somebody have to like, you know, bring you your mail basically like God – God give your mail to someone else. I always think about that sometimes. I'm like, can this person see through my soul? Like, in what instances do you think, why would God use another person to basically, like, read your mail to you? Well, I think if it operates, here's what you got to remember. In the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So prophets spoke for God. In the New Testament, we have the Holy Ghost. He ought to be able to speak to us yeah. without me having to have a prophet come talk to me. I think that prophets, the way that that operates is more in an affirmation or confirmation. In other words, God's dealing with me about this already. I feel this, and then, you know, somebody says, the Lord told me to tell you, and it's to me, okay, that's a confirmation. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let it be established. So I think it's very important that I understand that. Again, in the Old Testament, you know, uh, God spoke through men, you know, but in the New Testament, and I think we have to be careful, and I, I want to be very guarded what I'm about to say, but direct with it. We have to be careful when we're always wanting a prophet to speak something to us. Yeah. You know, the greatest prophet there is is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Why can't he tell me, Yeah. you know, uh, why do I have to have somebody else Always reading my mail or telling me something. Now, if that's the case, 
am I really that dull of hearing that I can't <laughs> hear God? Yeah. You know, no, seriously. Now, if I've got a deaf ear turned toward God, then, yeah, he may need somebody to step into my life and kind of thunder for him. Yeah. But other than that, you know, I think we need to learn how to trust the Holy Ghost and then allow the prophetic to operate in, in affirmation or confirmation. Yeah. Okay. I've been thrown before. Like when I told you that story a while ago, um, I mean, you know, this guy was introduced to me years ago. He, this is a prophet of the Lord. So, you know, I accepted it at face value. So when he called, I'm like, oh, wow, you know. But, uh, boy, I, I could really open up a can of worms here. Who, <laughs> who likes worms, you know? But in the Old Testament, you got a situation where a young prophet goes and does what God says, and an old prophet come to him and said, you're supposed to come home with me. Now, God told him, don't go home with anybody. So this old prophet steps on the scene, prophet, and tells him something different. And the guy said, okay. So he goes home with him, and while they're having dinner, the old prophet begins to prophesy to him. He says, thus saith the Lord, you're not going to return to the sepulcher of your fathers. You're going to die on the way home because you didn't do what God said. So we have to be careful because... Sometimes there could be a test by somebody coming into our lives to tell us something different to see if am I really going to do what he said or am I going to let this influence me, you know. Wow. <clears throat> uh, we've got to be careful. <laughs> and you have to be careful people wanting to say things to you out of jealousy. They're jealous of where you're going. They're jealous of your future. So they could say things to you that's detrimental try to destroy or get you off track. Now, I know I'm sounding very negative, but these things do happen. Yeah. And and I would tell people to be a little guarded. You know, again, I, I just want to go find myself in prayer, talking to God, open to whatever he wants to tell me, alter, and then letting him speak to me. Now, if he's not speaking, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And at the right time, it, it, the heavens will open. I just have to make sure that I'm in alignment with it. Yeah. The heavens will open and God will speak. I actually had a situation like that. I was praying, praying about something. I was like, God, if this is your will, open the doors. And I felt peace about it. And I even put other options out there. Those all closed. And this one kept opening. And I was like, all right. Like, it was confirm, confirm, confirm. And then someone, like a prophet in my life, said no. And I was like, so I questioned if I could, was that God, like for three months, I questioned, I was like, okay, I don't know how to hear the voice of God then. And then prayed about it more, went back and talked to that person. And it was like totally different. And I was like, okay, so maybe I did hear right. And like, I, I, I'm at peace with where I am. So let me give you some good advice. You got to be careful when let your peers be a prophet in your life. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying they can, but you got to be careful because you know, there's just a lot of things that come with that. A lot of familiarity. You know, I, I tell people when I know that somebody loves me and I'm familiar with them and they speak something, you know, the Lord, I have to weigh all that out. Are you, are you saying that because of your love for me and you're wanting to help me out? Or did the Holy Ghost really tell you that? Yeah. And, uh, and you, you, you just have to learn how to filter through it. And, uh, you know, now I'm not wanting to minimize God speaking through men of God, but at the same time, man, if I have to have that all the time, it's kind of like a, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a child growing and maturing. You know, when he's just a little infant or six, seven, five, or younger, so let's say four or five, and, you know, don't play on the road, don't play on the road. If you play on the road, then you're going to be disciplined. Don't, yeah. don't play on the road, don't play on the road. And uh, he doesn't understand the consequence of his actions. It's, it's, it's immaturity. That's the best way I can explain immaturity. You don't understand the consequence of your actions. Now, as that child begins to grow, I shouldn't have to tell him all the time, don't play in the street, you know. After a while, you know, you see that animal. I started to say cat, but <laughs> you're probably cat lovers going to watch this. You see <laughs> See that cat out there in the middle of the street, flatter than a pancake? Yeah. <laughs> That's why you don't play in the street. 
you know. <laughs> so, you know, and then all of a sudden they start to understand. They start putting it together. So, you know, I think the same thing <clears throat> with us. We need to mature to the point to where we don't have to have somebody constantly, you know, tell. Man, I've been to meetings where I've had four or five people walk up prophesying, and it just be all of them are different. You yeah. know, and I'd almost leave like, oh, you know, my head spinning. <laughs> and then I just, okay, God, this is what you told me. This is what I know your will is for my life. And if this is correct from these others, then you'll open the door and I'll know it and I'll walk through it. But I'm not going to alter my life. I'm not going to alter my life by the word of somebody else. If I'm going to alter it, I'm going to the altar and I'm going to let him speak yeah. to me. Yeah. A lot of people frustrated because of that, right? They're trying to do something God didn't call them to do. This question might offend some people, so if you don't want to answer, you don't have to. But <laughs> for those who, I guess, give a prophetic word to someone, would you say they had like a genuine heart or they just wanted to be prideful and just like see more spiritual? Or kind of the same goes with an interpretation of tongues, you know? The tongue go forth and someone interprets it. Would you say that person just had a bad spirit about them or would you say they just they thought they heard the voice of god i don't know if that question makes sense i'm trying to word it a better way what was the first way you yeah. worded it <laughs> okay i'm going to try to say this in a better way so when someone gives someone prophetic words saying oh god told me this and obviously they were wrong kind of in his situation mm -hmm. would you say that person was off because of their own hidden motives or because maybe they misheard the word of god i don't know how i'm trying to explain this well Man, <laughs> a lot of times it's pride. They want to be a little superior to you spiritually. And, you know, they feel like because, now I, I, I'm going to get in trouble what I'm about to say. I know people, you know, they go on long fast. And they do this, and then after the fast is over. And I tell people that I know, if you're going to go on a long fast, you need to let me know. Because I've seen more people messed up after a long fast because mm. if you're not careful you know i was talking to marilyn chenault the old prophetess that i mention all the time and i said sister chenault this guy's on a 40-day fast she said oh well, are they trying to compete with jesus <laughs> she said why 40 days and i said well i don't know you know she <laughs> said, well they're, to me it appears they're trying to compete with jesus mm. but if you're not careful after you pray a while you fast a while you almost get a superiority and pride that comes on you that I'm more spiritual than everybody else. Well, here's the thing. God can talk to you and you can be as carnal as a billy goat, <laughs> you know. And I know people that are that away. They've just learned to have an ear to hear it. I don't mean they're spiritual. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they could speak one minute and be as carnal as, you know, the next. So you have to be careful. But a lot of times I think it comes from pride or now, this will really get us. We're going to eat worms for sure, man. <laughs> Sorry about that. Witchcraft. Wow. Okay, if you remember, Paul mentions witchcraft as a work of the flesh. Now, a lot of people say that's rebellion, and I agree. But rebellion comes out of pride. And I want you to remember this, that witchcraft is any medium that I use to manipulate dominate or and intimidate a person or a group of people because I want my way. Mm. I want what I want. I want, I think I know what they need. So you have to be careful because I've heard people that were practicing witchcraft with this statement. The Lord told me to tell you, mm. Ooh. and they're trying to manipulate your lives to do what they think you ought to be doing. Not what God said, yeah. what they think you ought to be doing. And so, you know, I mean, you know, I was praying. I've been praying for you, and, you know, you know, the Lord showed me all these devils on your back, and, you know, you're going to die in 60 minutes, you know. Oh, my gosh. There, you you got to be careful with that because people can use it to manipulate you or even intimidate you. Yeah. You know, I'm praying, <clears> and, <throat> you know, you're, you're so carnal, you couldn't hear God if he thundered in the boot. But <laughs> I'm using some of those old southern things now. <laughs> But the deal is, you know, it can happen. It does happen. You have to be extremely careful with that, that somebody's not trying to control, 
control you for what they think. So, yeah. Did I answer that question? You did. Sorry for putting you in that <laughs> position. <laughs> Well, you're awful quiet down there. I know. I was just waiting my turn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Here comes a good one. Yes, sir. So you mentioned fear earlier. Uh, what do you think <clears> – <throat> what do you think between fear – so if, if, if a new um, transition in the will of God occurs, right, and um, you're aware of it but you're uncertain about it, how do you differ between – Fear kind of being the controlling factor, and I think you kind of touched on this a little bit. Fear being the controlling factor and just the reason why you don't feel to go or it may be being something that God actually doesn't want you to do. Does that make sense? So, mm -hmm. you know, because obviously there's, there's, a, there's a specific, precise will of God that appoints let me, people. Let me, I won't cut you off. I think when God's involved, it's not fear. I think it's you're troubled. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm troubled about this. I just don't, you know, I, something's, something's gelling, you know. I think that any fear, of course, fear can come right out of my human spirit, I mean. Uh, another thing is, I tell people that faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of, the, by the word of God. Fear comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the devil. It's me allowing him into my mind, speaking all the hypotheticals and the what ifs, and and then I'm 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 crippled with fear. To me, that separates it. I've always found that when it's God, the situation I'm trying, yeah, I get troubled. I'm like, oh boy, something mm -hmm. don't feel right, you yeah. know. Uh, we used to play a game, and this an old elder, another old elder. Told me, he said, you know, the will of God's kind of like playing hot or cold. I don't know if you guys ever played that, but, you know, you're blindfolded and they hide an object yes. in the room. Okay. <laughs> well, oh, the yeah. closer you get to it, man, you're, you're, you're getting warmer. You're getting warmer. And when you move away from it, man, you're getting colder. You're getting colder. That's kind of how the will of God operates. Mm -hmm. As long as I'm closer to it, I feel that passion for it and that. But when I'm going down a path and I'm, Feeling cold? Okay, I, I, I need to alter my course here. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think fear would definitely come from the enemy because it has torment. You know, and even Jesus rebuked the disciples. You know, they're in the boat over here terrified. And that's kind of that story kind of tickles me, the one of them, because he told them, let us go to the other side. And, you yeah. know, they wait, hey, you, don't you care that we perish? Well, how are you going to perish if I told you we're going to the other side? You're, you're allowing what you see to, to work on you, not what I said. And that's another thing I think that you have to learn about doing the will of God. It's not what you see, it's what you heard. Yeah. So, so kind of, I guess, just to, to follow up with that, um, so I've heard some people talk to me just kind of in their experiences about how, you know, fear was a part, was a factor, but ultimately they felt like it was a will of God, but there were some fears. So they ended up going to do it. But when they got there, they said, I don't know about this. I thought this was what it was. I thought this was the will of God, but I'm kind of seeing some things maybe that could show that where I'm at now could be the will of God but I feel like where I was could be the will of God. So when you make the decision, when you go and you're there, you've obeyed, you've done what you felt, there were some fears to it, but you're here. But then you kind of start in, to wonder in yourself, well, what if where I was before I made the decision could have been the will of God? You know. Okay, so. let's say that it is. Now what are you going to do? You can't go back. So you just make up your mind, you know what? I'm going to move forward. Yeah. And it happens. I mean, I've, I've been there before. So anybody tells you it hasn't, then they're not being honest with you. Sure. You know, I've gotten places that, oh, you know, boy, I missed this. <laughs> you know, wow, how did I get here? You know. Yeah. Uh, and, and you just have to pause, kind of regroup a little bit and say, okay, God, you're a very merciful God, and what what do I do now? 
how do I recover from this? What's my next step? Now, the problem that you're going to have is, well, you know, I missed it on this. So I don't know if I'm not going to miss this next deal. Yeah. But what else you got? Yeah. You know, you, you, you can't go back. I mean, I guess you could, but <laughs> anytime it's like kind of getting married, moving off, and then you go back, everything's changed. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, the landscape will have changed. I mean, you've, you've been somewhere else now. You've experienced some other things. So going back, you know, uh, you know, and another thing that I say is you've got to learn to dismiss how you feel. That'll That's lie to you. Yeah. That is hard. <laughs> oh, it will. It'll lie to you. Yeah. It'll mess you up. Yeah. Your emotions will lie to you. Yeah, absolutely. But most apostolics go on it. <laughs> I don't you think know. can of worms. <laughs> you have to learn how to let the word work. Yeah. You just, okay, God, this is what you said, so I don't have to feel the goosebumps or any inspiration. This is what you said. Yeah. And I kind of operate that way, especially in a church service. You know, I had a lot of evangelists and friends of mine, you know, they want it popping and moving and, you know, going off like a freight train. Yeah. Because they need that emotional response or whatever for them to be able to minister. Yeah. Mm. But I operate with, okay, what did God tell me to do in that service? I know. So I don't have to feel this rush. I can be totally calm and relaxed. You know, if the service is fast, slow, of course, I prefer it to be fast. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm not going to let that, how I'm feeling or even what they're doing, right. regulate what God's about to do. So, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question You did. Or not. You absolutely <laughs> answered it. Um, I don't know if the other guys have one. I was quiet for a while. So now I'm alive. <laughs> You're on a roll. I'm on a roll. <laughs> so, um, you were talking about learning the voice of God and, you know, your authority and just men that speak to you. So obviously uh, we must be submitted and we must have a, the man of God in our life. But in the new stages of, of learning, you know, as a young man that's trying to pursue ministry, such as these guys, um, how do you, What I guess, what is the balance of making sure that you go to the man of God, talk to him, hear what he has to say, in learning, okay, well, I need to learn myself too. Yeah. What's what? What's where's the where's the line and 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 what comes of that too? Well, to kind of I would say own. that it don't matter how old you are, how long you've been at it. Right. You need somebody in your life that has veto power. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we all can get off. Yeah. On a tangent or whatever. Yeah. And you need somebody that loves you. Right. Enough to correct you. Yes, sir say, you know, you're off course here. You don't yeah. need to be doing it, you know. Uh, I, I mean, it's hard for me to believe that a lot of people, you know, I grew up with these heroes. You know, Merle Ewing was a hero. And then later in life, God blessed me tremendously by our paths crossing in them. You know, for several years before he died, I considered him my pastor. And uh, so something happened. And, man, I mean, I was getting twisted up. I mean, mm. almost kind of getting bitter. Mm. You know, I felt like I'd been done wrong and, you know, mm. all this stuff's going on. And so so I popped off about it in front of some of my friends. Mm. And, one, of course, they all considered Brother Ewing an elder. So yeah. one of them went and told him. So he called me. I was preaching in Alexandria, and I was headed over to Houston to the airport. And. So Brother Ewing called and said, hey, I want to talk to you. Stop by. And so he loved this place, fried chicken. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it was good fried chicken, I have to say that. So we get there, we're eating, and then, man, the next thing I know, he rips into me. I mean, you know, I could have said, well, who do you think you're talking to? I'm a man of God, you know. I, yeah. Mm -mm. No, because he was saying something that I didn't see. Mm-hmm. And everybody needs a seer in their life that can see things and see where you're getting off, see how you need to correct it. Yeah. Not just enough to tell you you're wrong, right. but also how to correct it. Right. Somebody's always telling you how you're wrong. Then, mm. you know, yeah. If God's really doing this, he'll not only tell me where I'm wrong, he'll mm. tell me how to fix it. Yeah. And, boy, when he got through with me, you know, it, I was like, 
You know, he said, do you understand me? Yes, sir, I do. No, do you really understand me? And this is exactly how he said it. He said, you're going to shut your mouth about this and not say it again. Mm. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and, you know, and again, I, I, looking at it, I, I was done wrong. But he knew that I'm letting that into my spirit and I'm letting yeah. a root of bitterness take over. So yeah. he just kind of reached in there and jerked it out, you know. Wow. <laughs> and we all need that. Yes, sir. Don't ever get to the point where you feel like you're so spiritual yeah. or matured enough that you don't need some kind of influence in your life that can correct, warn, uh, plead. <laughs> yeah. And just tell you, you know. Uh, Brother Tenney, uh, when I went into the district office, he made me promise him that I'd have four or five guys around me that would watch me mm -hmm. to make sure that, and this was his words, not mine, to make sure that I moved from a prophetic type row to a political row. And if they see me doing that, they'd tell me. Mm -hmm. And so, and he said, if they tell you, you need to alter it. And so... You know, I live by that. Yeah. I think I proved it. I live by that. So, yes, yeah, I want people in my life, and yeah. I, I've got them. Yeah. You know, I mean, right now I consider Brother Billy Hale my pastor. And if he called me and told me right now, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of guys around me that that way. One of them is a very successful evangelist, but if his elder told him, you come home this weekend and he's done it. Yeah. It's pastor. I need you home. You need to come home. He didn't argue with him. You know, it put him, it put him at a disadvantage with whoever he was preaching for. Hey, I got to go home. Yeah. Well, we had you scheduled. I know you did, but yeah, my pastor, my elders telling me I need to come home. And so, you know, now they got to love you. Yeah. Because if they're correcting you and there's no love in it, then it's pretty, it's pretty harsh. No one else has a question. I have another one. <laughs> okay. Um, so how would you dwell on what God has said and not, you know, focus on the storm around you? Because I know there's many times I feel like God told me to do something or God told me something like a promise. For example, my, I had a vision of my seven, this is probably the only vision I've ever had in my life. Years ago, uh, evangelist was preaching on a Sunday night and I had a vision, um, getting baptized in our church baptismal tank. And I was like, you know, it's hard to believe because they're very strong Baptists and like mm -hmm. they, they could run the organization if they wanted to. Yeah. I was like, this she ain't getting in that water. But I held on to that and I prayed for it, prayed for, prayed for it. And uh, seven, eight, nine years later, literally just a couple months ago, she was baptized. So how, and through that seven, eight years, I was like just watching it, all the circumstances around us. I was like, she's not going to get baptized. Like it was hard for me to hold on to that word. How would you, how do you focus on the word and not focus on the storm that's around you? Well, with anything, there's distractions. And the enemy wants to create distractions. Because here's another thing is, according to the wise man, everything has a season. So whatever this thing is that God told you he's going to do, it has a shelf life. It has a time for it to happen. You know, man, I... I when God speaks to us, this, this is what I say. Only God can be the beginning and the end at the same time. So when God speaks to us, he's standing at the finished product because he's eternal. He's already over there. Cease. Now, I'm not there. But my, the process of my walk with God and my faith is, is to move toward it. And I call it the pull of the future. All things return to its source. So when God ejects his word into my spirit, speaks to me, there's an automatic pulling on that to return to where it comes from. Now, this may be a twist in the verse, <laughs> but it does say that the word, my word will not return void. But how does his word return? That's the question. How does it return? You know, I think it returns when I echo it back. Uh, that's me, you know, and I'm moving toward it. So the seed of his word's in me, and I'm going back toward the source of it. I don't know if I'm making sense or not. Yeah. 
So that's very important that you allow that to pull you and you to be on time. You know, let's say you can't buy apples at the grocery store and market. The only way you get apples is you got to go to the orchard. Well, if I go in June, even July, it don't matter how much faith I got, I'm not going to get any apples. Or if I wait till November, December, I get out there, and now I'm upset because all the apples are on the ground rotting. So the enemy's objective is, is to let me be premature early or late. And if you'll remember, here's, here's a good illustration. When Jesus breathed on them at Bethany, there's 500 of them. But 380 of them got distracted. They weren't there. And it doesn't mean that they didn't get the Holy Ghost eventually, but they were not there for the promise. And so that's kind of why the angel of the Lord said, why stand you here gazing? That's, that's, that's a lot of what we do. God speaks to us, and we just kind of want to sit there and gaze. Yeah. Oh, that's where he spoke it to me. No, now you got to move forward. You know, now when they were, you know, 10 days, I don't mean they were just sitting in this room for 10 days and everybody trying to get the same thought at the same time and get, you know, but what that, if you read it, they were continuing the temple praising, worshiping God. And I think that's a key factor in me waiting on the promise and moving toward it as I maintain the ability to worship him and praise him. And, uh, you know, I think that's really important. But it pulls, you know, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. But, you know, 380 of them did, weren't there. So it's easy for all of us to be standing at a prophetic moment but get distracted, you know. Well, he's gone, <laughs> you know. I don't feel that. I don't feel that. Um, maybe I need to preach this. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel that goosebump going off. He's gone. No, it was inspirational when he was talking to me, but he's disappeared. That's kind of how it works. He speaks something to us, man. We're just like, wow. And then where did he go? <laughs> you know, uh-oh, we're kind of on our own here a little bit. Yeah. No, Habakkuk said, write the vision, make it plain, and run with it until it's appointed time. So everything that God does has an appointed time because we live in time, and these things are fulfilled with us in time. Now with God, no. No, that's not how it works with God. So when he makes you a promise, it's not a matter of, can I do it? It's a matter of, I've really already done it. I showed it to you by words. And I think that's faith. It's a word picture. He, he, he speaks to us and allows us to see it. I think it's the power of, an. I'm, I'm not going to say imagination, but it is the power of imaging what God is speaking, you know. Okay. All right, I see what you're saying, God. Now I'm going to move toward that. And I want to move at the right pace. I'm not going to get frustrated. I don't want to get there too early. And then I for sure don't want to get there late. If I get there too early, I can always back up and come at a later date. But if I'm there after it's over, then that's, that's what I don't want. You know, and I mean, God's made me some promises, and I've kind of been telling him here lately, you know, Lord, I'm 61 now, so if you want to do this, you might want to hurry up and get it done. But it, it has an appointed time, and I have to remember that and just be patient, and patience possess you your soul. Yeah. So I have to learn to be patient, wait on God, and, okay, God, you'll do this. I don't know altogether how you're going to do it, but you will do it, and I keep that. Paul told Timothy, now concerning the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war good warfare. You got to learn how to fight for your prophecies. Yeah. I'm not going to let the enemy take them. Yeah. I'm not going to let them get sabotaged. I'm going to fight war for them. Yeah. So, yeah. Now that you said that, um, there are, I know there's times where some people or even myself where God gives me a promise and I'm like, okay, I mean, I don't say this out loud, but subliminally I'm like, why do I need to pray for it? He said it's going to happen. So I'm, <laughs> there's no well, <laughs> point. you know, there's a lot of truth in that. I don't think prayer is going to earn it or make it happen. I think prayer is going to keep my flesh out of the way. Yeah. So that I'll see it happen. Yeah. And my eyes aren't blinded because of my own carnality or flesh or whatever. 
I think when Jesus come down and cast the devils out of the lunatic boy, and you know he's addressing the disciples, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. I think that some people maybe misunderstand, or I may be the one that's got it twisted. But if you'll look at that, I don't think Jesus was talking about casting out devils. Because he talked about that, and then he was addressing the disciples and their unbelief. So now the subject's unbelief. And this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, most of the time we say the devils. But I think it's the unbelief that limited them. Uh, and here's, here's where that works a lot is, I think we all would say, God can heal, God can raise from the dead, God can deliver, but here's our unbelief. Can he do it through me? Yeah. Oh, we believe he can do it, but through me? Yeah. Now you've met your unbelief. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I, I don't want to get into this, but unless you guys, but now, you know, it's dealing with your identity. Mm-hmm. That's, that's very, very important that you maintain um, we got to know who we are. We have to know who we are in him. And, uh, you know, I don't think that I have to. I talked to a man this week, and he was a little concerned about, you know, all this spiritual warfare, and, you know, we're binding and loosening and fighting against this stuff and all. And he said, you know, I don't understand all that because he said, I thought Jesus had already conquered it. And I said, yes, he has. I said, I think the reason why we have to war and fight so much is because we're dealing with us. You know, I don't have to go twist God's arm for his power. It's already there. You know, uh, this is an old message, man. I've preached this a million times. (laughs) But I call it power according to purpose. When you find God's purpose, he allocates his power to fulfill it. If, if I only want power, then I'm an egotistical maniac going to self-destruct. Because the craving for power comes out of human nature. So, you know, I hear people, I need more power. I want the power of the Holy Ghost operating. For what? Now, when God speaks to you and tells you this is what I'm going to do, then he sends the power and the grace to do it. So... Why do I need this power if I don't even know what to do with yeah. it? You know, yeah. I mean, that's kind of, you know, the Lord spoke to me one night, and I, I won't take too long on this, and spoke to me very clearly about raising a woman from the dead. She was in the hospital, brain dead. He's going to turn the machines off. Wow. <clears throat> and it was on a Sunday night. Service is over. Her brother walked up, told me they're going to they're gonna unplug the machines tomorrow. And I'm standing there. The Holy Ghost said, nope, tell him she's not going to die. She's going to live. I'm kind of like, okay, you know. <laughs> and I said, Sonny, I said, uh, Phyllis is not going to die. She's going to live. And I said, now, it has nothing to do with your medicine as Native Americans. It has everything to do with the power of the name of Jesus. So I took the assistant pastor with me. We went up there. We walked in, and, uh, um, you know, I mean, nothing sensational happened. I just walked over there, laid my hands on her. I said, Anointed her, I said, Phyllis, the Lord said, you'll live and not die. I speak life into your body in Jesus' name. There was no tongue talking. There was no dancing. There was no jerking her around in the bed. (laughs) That was it. But why did I need all that other stuff if I knew this is what God said? And he will send his power to fulfill his word, what what he told me he would do. So anyway, so we left. We got out in the hallway, and the assistant pastor, uh, Brother Terry Harmon, uh, he said, that's it. <laughs> I said, what? He, I was expecting a little more than that, you know. I said, it's done. And the next morning, seven something, my phone rings, and it was Sonny, her, this woman's brother, telling me that she had responded, come to, they're going to run some tests, come back, there's nothing wrong with her, send her home. Mm. So, you know, you got to, you just can't let how you feel or distractions. You know, now, you know, from the time I left the service where I felt that, the time I got up there to the to the waiting room and walked into, wasn't the most pleasant situation because, you know, there's people up there that didn't believe like I believe. They, you know, they had a different religious practice. 
So when I walked in and told them this has nothing to do with what you're doing, well, they were you know, happy. They they didn't like that. Mm -mm. So you know, but on the journey up there, you know, there were moments like, oh boy, you know, mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I already said it, and I yeah. knew that the Lord had told me that standing there. So anyway, I keep going back around the same thing. <laughs> Because I think, like, when, say, someone has, like, okay, that kid, if I were to pray for him, I'm not going to lie. Like, I'd feel like, well, I don't expect much because I feel like I've never, like, seen something yeah. major like that happen. So it's how to, and I'm like, great, he's not getting healed because of my unbelief. <laughs> like, how do I, well, like, overcome that? Gradually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you, there, there has to be there, the gift of faith. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. And, uh, you know, I, I tell this a lot, but, you know, God spoke to me one night that I'll heal everything in the building tomorrow night. And I'm like, everything? Yeah, everything. So Sunday morning, man, we had a crazy service. It was just wide open. I mean, they were running. And, and then we got back Sunday night, the healing service, and, brother, it was dead. I mean, it was and I got nervous. This is where I kind of learned some of this. I got nervous. And so anyway, so they're not responding. I'm waiting for that emotional rush of whatever it is, you know, it's going to come in here like I felt the night before. Nope. So I step off the p platform and I said, okay, I said, we don't have to be doing all this for God to do it. You know, I said, so God's going to, and, and when I stepped down on the floor, it felt like something draped over my shoulders. And I kind of turned around to see. I thought, you know, some one of those crazy young preachers <laughs> had put a coat on my shoulders or something. And I wasn't quite sure what was going on. Nobody, and I heard these words, the gift of faith now rests upon you. I think that when, and you got to remember this, I think that when we take that step of faith, God never asked us to have great faith. He said, all you need is faith is the grain of a mustard seed. Because to me, the gift of faith fills the deficit. Mm. So let me give you this for example. So I'm looking at this. First person in the line has Parkinson's disease. I mean, her arms drawn, shaking. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, we could have started with something <laughs> a little easier, you know, back aches or headaches, <laughs> stuff people can't see. Yeah. You know? Uh-uh. And so I'm standing there, and it's like this. I needed $100 worth of faith. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a deal in banking called insufficient funds. I say it's insufficient faith. Okay. That's good. So I'm looking at the situation. I know that I don't have enough faith for this. I'm just being honest with God. God, I'm, I'm and that's where I was at. <clears throat> I had about $10 worth of faith, and I needed 100 So God stepped in and said, okay, you have a deficit. Yeah. Then here, I'm going to make a deposit. This is how the gift of faith operates. I'm going to make a wow. deposit and give you the faith that you need to see this accomplished. I told you this was going to happen. So I'm going to give you whatever needs to be done. Now, with that in mind, I would say that before I just go pray for somebody and jump up and whatever, I need to know that God has dealt with me about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I may be wrong in all this, but and when I'm in a service, <laughs> You know, I see a lot of people just praying for whoever. I kind of wait on direction. You know, we can a mass prayer or whatever. But now when God singles somebody out and tells me this, this, or this, then uh, I'm headed toward that. Yeah. And by the time I usually get there, I feel that gift of faith operating. So I just start asking God, Lord, allow the gift of faith to operate in my life that I can accomplish what, you know, what. And here's another thing. If that happens when it's done, you you can't take the credit. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're standing there like, I had a deficit here, you know. It's <laughs> yeah. surely not because of what I was doing, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's the grace of God. And I mean, when that was going on, that woman just starts, I mean, I, I might have been five, six feet from her. And she just starts turning and, and twirling and, when she stopped, the Parkinson's was gone. She was instantly healed. Wow. And then it went from her to the lady behind her, and it just started going down the line. Everybody in that line started just boom, boom, boom. 
Well, I'm still standing up there, you know. I tell people with my cards printed up, Mark Morgan Faith Eater coming to town. <laughs> now I can't pass them out because I haven't anointed anybody. Yeah. You know, this is God's gift to me right now to see this accomplished, see it fulfilled. That's why I'm saying he will give us his power to fulfill his purpose. Yeah. Wow. Does anybody else have any questions? That's good. That's it. Wow. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Well, I hope we can have you again. Sure. I'm really happy that you came. Um, It'd be cool to almost do a series with you. (laughs) Um, (laughs) We can work on it. (laughs) Whenever you're in town, just stop by. Um, This has been episode 11 with Brother Morgan and Garrett and Jonathan. And this has been Out of the Boat.